Wait, what? <laughs> Nikita's gonna see it. What You're <laughs> Why do you think I've been over here this whole time? Because I because anyway. they just start with no warning. This is how they roll here. They want yeah. like Raw. authenticity. <laughs> what was that, Summer? <laughs> <laughs> Raw. Um, I'm so excited to be back at this gallery, which I love. It's such a fantastic hidden gem soon to be hidden no longer, I think, the more people hear about it, right? Everyone comes here and falls in love with the space and the location and the amazing work that gets shown here, which so far has been really eclectic, but always, um, I feel like, really about storytelling. Like, so far, all the things that I've seen come through this gallery have a, a real story to tell, which is so exciting. And today is no different. So we're here with Summer Bernal, the curator of the current exhibition, more or less against her will, but she's gonna be amazing. <laughs> and most importantly, uh, the two artists, Daniela Garcia, who we prefer to call Danny, and Hetty Torres. And it is so lovely to meet you both and to see this incredible show. Um, I'm just gonna just jump right in with letting you both, you each, introduce yourselves to the audience. Um, we might as well start with you, Hetty, because uh, we're sitting in, um, in your half of the gallery. <laughs> well, perfect. As you guys hear, my name is Heidi, but I have actually two names and two last names, Heidi Viviana Torres Cárdenas. And I was born in Mexico, Colima, Mexico, in 1988. I was there until the age of 18. And I moved to United States trying to learn English so I can probably travel overseas and study um, in probably in Europe, but I stay in, um, in the United States. Um, I was really <laughs> a wild person, so my parents didn't want me back in Mexico. That's why <laughs> I stay here. And it's been an odyssey. It's very, being in America and the United States has been very challenging, but the great thing about having challenges in life is basically you learn how to be a better person, how to be a better human being, how to be a better artist, how to be a better friend. And that's pretty much me, an immigrant, a Mexican immigrant in California, in Los Angeles, and also an artist. And that's me. <laughs> Excellent. And were you uh, an artist? I mean, did you always want to be an artist or did that happen later? I mean, 18 is still pretty young. I don't know how many of us know what we want to be at 18, but where along that journey did painting start for you? Um, I, always, uh, I, I always love art since I know that I, since I have memory, and I really, we used to watch Channel 5 in Mexico and they would show um, videos from Bob Rose, like the, the classes. <sighs> And I fell so much in love with the, with the, the way he would paint landscapes. Mm -hmm. And I asked my mom for like paints and because we didn't have enough money, but we had a papeleria. Papeleria is a little store where they sell books and things for a school. And she gave me watercolor, watercolor paint. And was so discour discouraged because I didn't know how to use it. I thought it was gonna be the same, the same, um, medium that Bob Ross was using and I was very very discouraged because I did a mess. Basically I did a mess <laughs> on paper. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, I'm not a good artist. <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm gonna have to discard that and start using pencil. I used pencil all my life until the age uh, of 18. When I came here, I actually bought my first materials in Walmart, up north in Portobello. And my first painting was a, pay, a pear. A pear? Is that what you say? Pear? Yeah. Pear, a fruit pear. Oh, okay. It wasn't the best. And but it wasn't the best. Yes. And you know, in Mexico, we have a bad, uh, like, taboo or a bad um, aspect of being an artist. Like, there is a misinformation about being an artist uh, in, 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 in Latin America, mm -hmm. especially Mexico, Central America, because they always say, that if you're not as you're gonna be die, you're gonna die poor. And I was studying for registered nurse, and when I changed my major for art, 
um, my family was like, how come you're gonna change your major? You're gonna be poor all your life. Like people really, really die poor. Yeah. And I was like, well, I'm gonna study my master's degree if I have to do a, bachelor, a, a master's and a, or PhD, I will do it, but I really wanna do art. And I stay in art and I'm here doing art and also working a full time job because sometimes being an artist is not easy <laughs> and it takes some time in order for you to be recognized, in order for you to be in galleries and in order for you to start actually selling artwork and being a full time artist. So that's pretty much me. Fantastic. I love that so much. <laughs> Thank you. No, and I'm, I'm glad I asked because when we come back in a minute and talk about the work, it really does seem like there's so much familial empathy and lived experience, you know, coming out of the work, and it, it, it makes sense that there's some some trap with your with your own experience, right? It's very mm -hmm. much it's personal as well as sort of societal. So that's exciting. So it's outdoor, LA, you know, the environment. I'm looking forward to getting. Okay, thank you. Awesome, <laughs> Danny. What's your story? How did you yeah. get from there to here? Um, so it's actually kind of similar uh, to Heidi's. I always did kind of like drawing as a kid, but like growing up in like an immigrant family, like I'm not an immigrant, but my parents were. So like the number one thing they always pushed was being able to find something where you're self-sustainable. It's like once you can be self-sustainable, it's like you've made a life for yourself. So like when I went through high school, like I took classes, I was, I was good, like I won art contests, but it was never, it always, no, it didn't matter how many contests I won, like my parents were always like, well that's great, put that to the side and decide what you're gonna do. And I was actually going to school for nursing, the same, same as yeah. Heidi. When you come from Mexican parents, they either want you to be a nurse, a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer. Yeah, those are, those are the only career paths you get. Anything else is a no-no. So I was in the nursing program. I was one class away from um, like basically getting into the position where it would be like the two-year track and then I'd be ready to be a nurse. And I remember that it was on a day that it had been the fourth time I had ditched my microbiology class. And I was on my way to like, I think a museum in like Santa Barbara that like on the way there, I was like, I don't want to do this. <laughs> And like I got home that day and like I went online and like I changed my major to like studio arts and I remember when I came home I told my mom and my mom was surprisingly okay with it because my mom was always the kind of person that was like look I didn't get to live my dreams because I had to raise kids I had to do all this but you guys have the chance so do whatever you want to do and my mom was supportive and when I told my dad he didn't talk to me for two weeks <laughs> he was very upset <laughs> yeah. yeah and I remember that like when I transitioned to like art, um, I knew that I wanted to go to Long Beach, like I had always been told it was a great school. So when I applied to go there, I didn't tell my parents this, but that was the only school I applied to, for to like transfer into. And my parents were like, well, what are the schools you applied to? And I was like, oh, a couple. That was the only one. And I was riding on like getting into that one school. And luckily I did. So when I went in there, like I remember the first thing my dad asked was like, well, what, what else are you doing? And I was like, oh, well, I'm going to be a teacher, too. And then he was like, great. Right. Right. He's like, great, like, make sure you do that. And like, it, like, when I started going through the program and all that stuff, like, the first thing he'd always ask, he'd be like, well, when are you starting the teaching classes? And I'd be like, OK, well, afterwards. Any second. Yeah. <laughs> but like, kind of fast forward a little bit. Like, I did my BFA. I did the teaching. And I've been teaching at a high school for the past two years. And I actually love it. It's really fun working with the kids. Um, but it's been great to see that like since I graduated from like my bachelor's I've had the opportunity to show um, quite a bit in just a couple shows around the place and my dad has come to most and he's like slowly starting to come around like especially after I told him how well this show went he I was, was like say, show him pictures, send him pictures <laughs> of the red dots he know, yeah right? so it's like yeah. after I told him that he was like oh he's like are you having another show soon uh -huh. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> So he's like, he's come over to like the good side now. <laughs> good. Well, and I mean, that's so interesting to me too, because, you know, the dynamic within the family, but also the teaching. And so the yeah. time you're spending with children and their families. Yeah. And then to look at the work and know yeah. that you are fa seem to be fascinated with those domestic spaces and the yeah. dynamic of what goes on, in, you know, in, within the families and extended families. And the, yes. That 
makes sense in the same way that I, my hot take of you made sense that you were looking at the world and kind of really the perfect place to do this kind of structure of two related solo shows. Right. Because then you have this kind of threshold space where you can have them in conversation, but they each get their own space, but they're not really separate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, it's sort of, I, I think it just absolutely begs for this format. For, yeah, for a and, you know, I mean, anything, it's a beautiful space and anything would look great in here, but it really has this extra kind of magic of this, of this kind of presentation, I it, think. It does, it could be a little challenging, but yeah. it, it works. And that's what I do appreciate about this space. Is that so well, you guys, right, so, so you, then you knew. And then yeah, it was just. Yeah, and then just, I was like, well, yeah. no. And also then realizing how big their works were, because it was like, oh, I, I want you guys, great. Maybe I need more. But then I saw, oh wait, their pieces are big. So, <laughs> like, that's it. It's, I'll make it work, yeah. you know? <laughs> and they're not only big, but every single image, even the ones that are like 14 by 14, there's a lot happening in them. So they're not only this gorgeous scale, but they're so saturated with all this amazing color and these you know, hyper detailed patterns and all of the different textiles and patterns and, all, and the text. So they need room like you've given them in order that each one can kind of be its own world. Because you really do kind of need to spend some time you need to see what story is being told in, in words. You need to get up and understand that you basically rewove every rug <laughs> with a paintbrush. I mean, that the detail and the richness of that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah you, you wouldn't want a crowd mm -hmm. because there's just so much incredible information in here. And the good thing about that is, though, Carlos is super supportive of the decisions that I've made coming into this space. So this is the second time I get to curate in his space, and I don't he lets think me, it'll be the last. And he lets <laughs> me just go for it and just, you know, he gives direction when I ask for it, or I could see he's moving a certain way. But other than that, it's been really nice to be able to just come into the space and feel it out and be like, this is what feels good to me. That's yeah, good. it does, and it does feel good in here.